Lord, we thank you for tonight. Man, it's so good to be together, to be reminded of the fact that your love is unconditional. It's unchanging. The same yesterday, today, tomorrow. Lord, it's something that we can always count on and always trust. And Lord, I thank you. I thank you for tonight and the time we get together together, to be together as family and enjoy the time. So Lord, I pray that you make the most of tonight. We've got whatever time we have left. And Lord, we thank you for what you've done so far. And Lord, we pray that you continue to change lives. You continue to soften our hearts. Draw us unto your name. Help us to see you for who you are and understand who you see us and how you see us to be. And the privilege that we get to live out of that. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I'll go ahead and have a seat. Man, sure grateful for Rebecca jumping up here. Isn't it nice to see her up here playing? Absolutely. Grateful to have her leading us in worship tonight. We're going to be awesome to have David Pencil here in just a little bit. So we've kind of got the, the full spectrum this evening of worship. We're going to enjoy our, ourselves together. You guys know last week we, we started uh, talking about being authentic. And so we're going to recap a little bit here at the beginning. And uh, we talked last week about how how um, people perceive Christians. And we had a chance to kind of look through all of the different things. We looked at all kinds of different world religions and the first things that came to our mind that we got to the, to the Christian part. You know the thing that is amazing to me is if we would have been able to calculate all of the responses when I said, what's the first thing that comes to your mind when I say born again Christian or when I say Christian, it would be interesting to see what percentage of our answers were negative versus what percentage of our answers were positive on that. Because you know what's amazing to me is as a believer, when you think of the first thing that comes to your mind about Christians, is it positive or is it negative? It's really amazing how even we, when we think of Christianity, even we oftentimes are uber, uber critical of Christians. And we, we, we evaluate at a very, very critical level, in fact. And I mean, I tell you, I wish that that was different. I wish that our answers were different. I wish that people um, who are pursuing uh, this relationship with Jesus, their perception was different of Christians. People who, who could care less about Jesus, who could care less about if there even is a God. I wish their perspective and, and responses about who we are and, and how we live our lives was, was much more positive than it really is. Guys, last week we talked about how important impressions are and the fact that Jesus knew how important impressions are because Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, he says, to let your light shine before all men in such a way that they may see your good works and then glorify your Father who is in heaven. See, Jesus understood how important it is to make sure that we are living out of the way that God sees us, the way that God has designed us. It's very important that we grasp that. And this is why Jesus is saying that the attitudes and the actions of each of his followers, they're going to do one of two things. Either they're going to draw people unto him or they're going to drive people further away from ever wanting to have a relationship with him. Just in the way that we respond, in the way that we in the way that we live out our lives on a daily basis. And so tonight I want to remind you that we're going to spend tonight and then for the next two weeks we're going to talk about the three qualities. There are three qualities that people who are kicking the tires of Christianity, people who are watching you, the people who are curious about the things of God and they're curious about you and why you live your life the way that you do. There's, there's three qualities that they find almost irresistible. And the number one is authenticity, the number two is compassion, and then the number three is sacrifice. And so those three things, tonight we finish authenticity, next week we talk about compassion, and then the following week we're going to talk about sacrifice. And so the thing is, tonight, our key truth, the key truth, if you get nothing else, this is the second week in a row, so hopefully this one's in our minds, okay? Uh, but, but if you get nothing else tonight, please understand this, if you want to be contagious as a believer, if you long for people to be drawn, not only to you, but Christ in you, you have to be authentic. If you're not real, people will not give you the time of day and you'll be just like every other Christian hypocrite that they know. That's not who we're called to be. Last week I asked a question. If you ask people what quality they loathe the most about people, usually the answer is somewhere in the, the realm of dishonesty. 
If somebody's dishonest, that's something I, I, I can't handle that with people. But if you ask people, what's the thing that really draws you? What's the thing that is most attractive about people? And it's just the, it's just the opposite of that, of course, right? It's, it's making sure that we're honest, making sure that we're authentic, making sure that we're genuine. Whenever we're genuine, you can think about that. If people that you know, if they have those qualities, you're cool being around them. But man, if they're dishonest, you think you can't trust them? Don't have any time for them. And so here's the thing. One of the most effective ways, no matter what we get to tonight, no matter what's going on, in order to be authentic, one of the most effective ways that we can be authentic, one of the most effective ways that we can draw people, one of the most effective ways we can be in relationship with people and point them to the transforming love of God, one of the most effective ways we do that is to be real. If we're not real, then we can forget it. Because people don't have time for in genuine people have no time for that and so here we go a little recap four areas of authenticity that are sure to turn heads towards heaven last week we talked about making sure that we have an authentic identity if we want to be a contagious christian we've got to stop apologizing for the way we are we've got to stop apologizing for the way that god wired us the way that he put us together We've got to stop apologizing and stop denying our basic identity, our basic personality. We have to stop trying to stuff ourselves into somebody else's mold of what it means to be a Christian. If we try to simply be in this mold that somebody else has designed, it's never going to work. We have to understand that we are authentically created with a specific identity. Because Psalm 139 says, you're fearfully and wonderfully made. Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit, when you were knit together, you were specifically and purposefully made wonderful. So my goodness, please quit trying to be somebody you're not. Please quit trying to be more than you are. And please quit trying to be less than you are. It's very important that we have an authentic Identity, And as we live out this authenticity, as we live out this uniqueness that we have, when we do that, it becomes a compelling witness for people that are like you. Because if you're a wallflower and you really don't want attention drawn to you, it's important that you are that way. It's important that you live out that way. Because there are other people that are going to see you and go, ah, I see that. And they're going to see Jesus in you. They're going to be drawn to you. If you're this big, boisterous, outgoing, whatever, then be that way. Be who you are. Make sure that you are who God created you to be and know how he sees you. Because there are other people that the only way that they're going to fall in love with Jesus is if they see a connection. If there is a common ground. And as they see that in you, then they are drawn to you. And then they realize... It's Jesus, because I'm this way, and I'm big and boisterous, and I'm loud, but I'm reckless. And I always find myself in trouble, and I always, whatever it is, but you don't. But we seem to have the same, so why is that? And so it's important that we have this authentic identity, so that somebody just like you can see Jesus. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. So we've got to be and have an authentic identity. And then the second thing we talked about is to be emotionally authentic. Man, there are people who are unreligious that love to be around Jesus. They flocked to him. My question last week, convicting to me, convicting to many of you, how many people who don't love Jesus long to be around you? Do you have people that don't love Jesus that really, man, if they could spend more time with you, they would. They would they flock and they want to be around you. That's a very important thing for us to evaluate. If that's not the case, please ask why. Please ask yourself why. Please ask God why. Please ask why. Because Jesus, if we're a Christ follower, we want to be like him. He was that way, so therefore we long to be that way. The coolest thing about Jesus is right out there in public when his good friend Lazarus died. And he had been buried. He's really dead. He'd been dead for four days. And Jesus is at the tomb, and he's there with Mary and Martha, and he's there with, with all these people in public. And Jesus, the shortest verse in all of the Bible, in that moment, Jesus wept. He was emotionally authentic. Jesus knew who he was, and he acted out of that. And Jesus was in touch with the emotional side of who God had made him to be. And so therefore, guys, we've got to be. We've got to be connected emotionally 
to the things of this world. We've got to care at a deeper level. Because you want to know the thing that people that are trying to figure out what Christianity is all about, what they need to see in you, what they need to see in you is they need to see you grapple with fear. They need to see you deal with sadness. They need to see when you get hacked off and mad, they need to see how you handle that. It's very important for the people all around us to see exactly how real we are when jealousy shows up. When there's a loss and we're mourning and we're grieving. People who are spiritually curious and kind of trying to check out who Jesus is important, they need to be able to see this. And guys, they need to hear us talk about it openly. Now what I'm not saying is, please don't go out and air your dirty laundry. Nobody needs to know all the nitty gritty details of your life. But what they do need to see is they need to see you wrestle with life. They need to see you in the wrestling match of, of man, I'm not sure about what's coming, but I'm, I, I'm sure about what's coming. You know what I'm saying? You know you're going to be okay, you're just not sure how it's going to happen? They need to see you wrestle with that. They need to see this, and it's important for them because it's an identity that gives them hope. It gives them peace. We've got to be emotionally authentic. Because people need to watch us work out our faith when we're right smack dab in the middle of the fire. So let people in. Let people into your life at that level. And be authentically emotional. Be authentically connected to your emotion and to your identity. And then we get to tonight. No more review. Here we go. You ready? Number three. Ooh. Anybody good at that? Anybody not good at that? Gentlemen, here's the number one phrase you need to learn right now if you don't already know it. I want you to look at your wife. Just look at your wife. If you have a wife sitting next to you, look at your wife and say, I'm sorry, honey. I was wrong. You were right. And now wives do the same thing except this time say, I was wrong and you're always right. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Man, genuinely admit when you are wrong. Oh my gosh, people. There is not one thing that we can do better than admitting this. We have got to own it. When we mess up, man, we live in a day and age that is just riddled with I can't admit I'm wrong. We live in a culture that points fingers and says it's your fault. We live in a culture where professional athletes, when they get in trouble, they just hire a bigger attorney. They just hire a more powerful attorney to get excused from wrongdoing. Everybody knows it. We know it, okay? We, we, this is the culture that we live. We live in the age of finger pointing. And the thing is, is that it's not discriminatory. It's not with Christians. It's not with, with people who are far from God. Not with people who are sojourners and seeking the things of the spiritual realm. I mean, everybody. Everybody on the planet, it seems. Our culture is a culture of finger pointing. We have to admit when we are wrong. It is one of the things that people who are looking at Christianity, they go, you know what? If anything about Christianity, that dude owns when he messes up. That girl, she knows when she messes up, she always makes it right. That's something for us to be known for. Genuinely admit when you are wrong. I'm going, to, I'm going to back up a little bit from the, from the verse that I read while ago. Matthew chapter 5. We're going to back up to verse 13. And here's why it is so important that we can admit when we're wrong. Man, I know some of you guys are squirming right now because you're thinking, I do not do this well at all. This is something you have got to learn. This is a heart problem. If you can't admit that you are wrong, this is a heart problem. And there is a battle for your heart. The enemy versus the Savior of the world. Matthew 5, here's your reason why. Verse 13, Jesus says, You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how should its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Next idea. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. And then we get to our verse, the key verse. In the same way, let your light shine before others in such a way that they may see your good works and then glorify your Father 
who is in heaven. Jesus gives us several examples here of how important it is to understand that people who are spiritually curious need to see how devoted Christians deal with their mess-ups and with their sins. It's very important that they see this. When we can admit that we are wrong, do you know what happens? It adds flavor. Just like salt, when you put it on your food, just the right amount adds flavor. Now what happens whenever you go overboard, you put too much salt? It jacks it up, right? It ruins it. Well, the same thing is true. If you try to be more than you are, and you try to be, you know, this overly authentic, and it almost comes across as put on, then it's a bad taste in somebody's mouth. Also, if you fall short, and you're just a little bit shy of actually admitting when you're wrong, this kind of normally goes this way. You know, it's kind of the apology that says, I'm so sorry that you got offended for what I said. <laughs> That's usually when we fall short, right? I'm so sorry you got offended. It's really your fault that you're upset with me, right? That's what it is. You know, I'm, I'm sorry, honey, that you got your feelings hurt because I, you know, and fill in the blank. That's when we fall short. But rather than owning it, I'm sorry that I really, I hurt you. I really jacked this up. I messed it up. What can I do? That's, that's, that's kind of that nice place. But saltiness. We're salt of the earth. Jesus put us on this earth, sprinkled us, and we're all over the earth in order to add flavor to this world. In order to add a good taste. In order to add good news. In order to add flavor to life. To be the light of the world. To be in this city on a hill that you can see from miles and miles away. Which means when people know about Christianity, you can see them all over the place. You can just see. Can't deny who they are. You got something happens. That's got to be Christians. I know. You good at owning mistakes? How about with your kids? How many times do you say you're sorry to your kids? You need to. You need to make sure that you get down on their level when you've gotten angry and you've gotten frustrated and you've said things that you wish you wouldn't have and you've hurt them. It's important to get down on their level and say, I'm sorry, honey. I know I hurt you. We've got to own it. Because remember, our children are sojourners. They're spiritually curious, wanting to know who God is. And we get the privilege of embodying and exemplifying God the Father to our children. The Holy Spirit to our children. We get the privilege of living that out. So we need to make sure that we can own it with our kids. How about co-workers, right? Yeah. Your boss. You know, it's very important that we can own it with our spouse. It's very, very important. You know, there's this story of a guy who worked um, at this company. And, and, and there was this, this boss who was not a believer, but he was watching all of the people who claimed to be believers in his company. And as he's watching them all carry out, there was one that stood out over and above all of the rest. And it was this one that he knew had recently come to know Jesus. And as he, uh, as, as he watched kind of what he did, the next thing he knew, this guy was knocking on his office door and came in to talk to him. And, and he, he was talking to his boss. He said, you know, I need to admit to some things that I've been doing. I've been working for you for a long time now. I need to admit to some things. I want you to know that for years now, I've been cheating on my expense report. I need you to know that I'm sorry and I'm going to pay it back. I want you to know that, that I've been cheating on my time card and I've been filling it in and giving extra hours and things like that. And I want you to know I'm so sorry that I've been doing this and I'm going to do everything I can to make it right. He said, I've been talking bad about you behind your back and I apologize for that. He said, I'm here and I want you to know this because you need to know and I need to make sure that I'm, I'm letting you know this. And he then admitted and he said, I want you to know that I realize that I should lose my job over this. I'm hoping that I don't, but I, I should lose my job over this. And I just want you to know, I'm sorry. I guess, can you imagine if that happened in your workplace? Can you imagine if one of the people who worked for you came and said that to you and you knew that they had just recently come to know Christ? What kind of flavor does that put in your mouth? How does that make you feel towards that person? Dude, I'm going to get all fired up with them. 
I'm going to sit here and celebrate and say, you're right, man. You're totally fired. But no, but no, I'm just, no, I'm not. I'm not. I'm going to say, man, I, I'm going to get so excited because there's life transformation that takes place. And the thing is, is that, you know what? I get it. There are some companies that, that, ought, that, that they're going to have to lose their job. You're going to have to lose your job for being that authentic. But I promise you, there's not a better message that we send on the face of this planet than to make sure that we know we admit when we are wrong. Because we're a light shining in the darkness, hopefully. Hopefully there's a difference. So you guys, how many of you guys have ever owned up to admitting that you were wrong? How many of you have ever done that? You done it? You said you were wrong? Good. Awesome. We should probably do this every day, shouldn't we? <laughs> we probably should. But I'm glad to hear that you guys are there. Because the thing is, this is the, this is the cool thing. People who are investigating Christianity, they're not expecting perfection from us. They expect perfection from Jesus, no doubt about it. But they don't expect perfection from us. And in fact, whenever they realize that we're not perfect by us owning our mistakes and by us being real with them and saying, my bad, I'm so sorry, I know I hurt you. And then we try to make... A restoration of that relationship it actually gives a freedom and a peace to them because it helps them understand that you know what I don't have to be perfect to follow Jesus it helps them understand that Jesus really is the Savior of the world and it's not just a one-time thing he's here to save us over and over and over again from the things that we mess up on a daily basis so the thing is, is that if you think that your testimony is hinging upon whether you make a mistake or not, it's really not. You can make mistakes. Just own them when you make them. And when you do that, the craziest thing happens. You give hope to all of the world. <laughs> Isn't that nuts? That's just the craziest thing you think about. Man, I messed up. Oh, you know, everybody else looks and says, oh, cool. I don't have to be perfect. Thank goodness. You know, it's so important that we genuinely admit when we are wrong. Because it, it adds flavor to our world. It adds hope to our world. It helps people see the real Jesus. And it helps people see the way God the Father is. So we genuinely admit when we're wrong. And then the last thing is this, okay? To turn those heads from people, the people who are, who are longing to see the truth about Jesus, in order to turn those heads, we've got to live with conviction. We've got to live a life that, man, when there is something that we are for sure about, like Jesus, we live this life in such a way that we will die for that truth. We live with conviction. It's kind of like this here. See these pictures here. You remember this one? You remember that? Exactly. Tiananmen Square. Good job. Remember this next one? No, you don't remember it. But you've seen it, right? You've seen it over and over and over again. Next one. Know that guy? Yeah. How about this next one? A little closer to home. Yeah. Egyptian martyrs, huh? We can go back to that one. Let's keep it up there for a second. It's important that you see this picture. How would we respond? Do we live with conviction? I think we should look at it for a second and realize, because this is a month and a half ago. And this is real. And none of those men are alive anymore. We'll go off of this one. You guys, people who are spiritually curious are longing to see conviction. Country club Christianity, there's no time for that. There's no time to come to church, pat ourselves on the back, make ourselves feel good about ourselves because we came to church. And then we go out and live however we want the rest of the week. We stand firm for the gospel. And we live a life of conviction. Man, I don't care who you are. When you see those pictures and you realize the stories behind those pictures, it has to fire you up, does it not? It has to fire you up when you see that and you go, man, 
do. Whether I agree with the cause or not, anytime you see that kind of a thing, you have to admit that you look at it and you kind of go, dude, that's, wow. Wow. I promise you, people who are spiritually curious, they are rarely impressed with spinelessness. When people who are spiritually curious are watching you as a believer, rarely do they go, you know what, that person's so weak, I think I'm going to follow them. Nobody says that. Everybody says, dude, that's the kind of guy I want to follow. That's the kind of girl I want to follow. Because that girl has conviction. And she will stand up for what she believes in. And she stands firm because she knows it to be the truth. Right or wrong, she knows it to be the truth. Whether a person agrees with you or not, they know that you believe it to be the truth. We have to live with conviction. And the reason we have to is that we look at Jesus yet again. Matthew chapter 27. Go ahead and turn there. I'm going to get you prepped beforehand. Matthew chapter 27 this is a very sobering moment of Scripture. This is the pivotal moment. And why we all sit here tonight in the way that we do. See, Scripture tells us the story of this battle hard not just yet, Carl. We'll get there in just a second. Scripture tells us of this battle-hardened Roman centurion who's watching everything that Jesus is doing. He watched whenever Jesus was hung on the cross. He watched whenever Jesus was left there in order to be ridiculed and mocked. He watched Jesus as he, as he maintained his claim to be God's Son. As he maintained the claim to be the savior of the world. And then this soldier watched Jesus as he made provisions for his mom. And as he gave forgiveness to a criminal next to him. And the centurion is watching all of this. Can you imagine watching? Can you imagine seeing this? And then the moment happened. And the the centurion began to shudder because literally the earth was shaking the moment Jesus breathed his last breath. And as this was shaking, all of a sudden the truth came clear and the truth became known. As Jesus cries out, it is finished. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And in that moment, the centurion realized the reality. And in verse 54, this earthquake and the things that were happening became very frightened. And the words came out of his mouth, truly this was the Son of God. I gotta tell you guys, a man like that, battle weary, battle worn centurion, he had to see to believe. He had to see the reality of Jesus. He had to see that Jesus wasn't just some celebrity walking the planet. Jesus was the real deal. And I promise you, anything short of what that centurion watched, he probably would not have become a Christ follower. And guys, there are people that you know that it takes you living this life of conviction, standing up, Owning what you believe in, knowing why you believe in that, and standing firm in that in order for them to see Jesus. For them to realize that he's the real deal because they know you. They know you and all your good. They know you and all your bad. They know you. And if you stand up for the truth of Jesus Christ, when you stand up and when you stand firm in that, and there's a conviction there, and you're willing to die for that truth. And there's a chance that this person will fall in love with Jesus. <clears throat> Guys, the spiritually curious don't have any time for spineless Christians. Don't have any time for weak Christianity. I don't. Do you? I promise, though, if they would live a life of Christ's conviction, then God will make us very contagious, just like Jesus. But, y'all, we've got to throw away the fluff. We've got to get rid of that. We got to get rid of the pomp and circumstance. And we got to get down to the nitty gritty of what it means to live life in this world. And so, my challenge tonight for all of us 
is that there are people all around every single one of us that deep down inside they are looking for somebody to proclaim the truth. They're looking for somebody to show a physical example, a tangible experience of who God is and who Jesus is. They're looking for that. And the question is, why can't it be you? Why can't it be me? I mean, we're the ones who are sitting here and we have the truth of Scripture at our fingertips. We have uh, the future in paradise for all eternity ahead of us. We have the Holy Spirit guiding us on a daily basis. We have the Savior of the world who died and we know that He died for us and He has saved us. So why can't it be us? Why can't we live that way? We've got to be real. And so guys, when we think about being authentic, I hope that every single day the ace of spades that we play is this card of authenticity. I hope it's the trump card of everything that we ever do. When in doubt, be authentic. When in doubt, be transparent. When in doubt, let people into your world. When in doubt, enter into their world in a way that you're not trying to make them be who you are. When in doubt, be authentic. The spiritually curious are counting on it because they are counting on the true definition of what it means to be the light of the world. Know who you are. Know how God created you. Be emotionally authentic with people. Admit when you are wrong. Make sure that you are living a life that is full of conviction. And as we do these things, guys, when we do these things, we will let our light shine before all men that so that they might see the true picture of our Father in heaven. And the coolest thing about that is that when we look at the definition of Christianity, we look at the perspective of Christianity as we know it today. The only way we begin to shift and make this seismic shift in the perception of Christianity is that it happens with each and every individual sitting in this room. Every one of us. Every one of us live a life of authenticity. And I promise you, you will turn heads. I promise you, people will long to be around you. And I promise you that they will fall in love with Jesus when they discover the true Jesus. So guys, that's our goal. And that's who God has made us to be. So I hope we can change the association of the word Christian. I hope that we take that as a charge and we live that with conviction as well. Deal? All right. Well, Lord, I pray tonight. Oh my goodness, Lord, help us. Because man, this life of conviction, this life of authenticity, this life of, of being transparent with people, it is, it's hard. And when we are... When we are bent towards the truth in everything that we do, Lord, it starts with people thinking it's too good to be true. And so, Lord, I pray that you help us to be consistent in that. I pray, Lord, that you help us in the highs and in the lows to seek you. I pray, Lord, that you help us to understand that we don't live a life that lets people in to our darkest secrets just on our own. That only happens through the person of Jesus. And so Lord, I pray that you let us let you in to those dark places. To shine your light. To expose the truth. To help us to deal with it. To turn it over to you. And then let you leverage it to change the world. And so Lord, I pray that you help us take off any mask that we might have. I pray, Lord, that you help us as the body of Christ to live in this world and let our light shine. To live in this world and add flavor to it because we're allowing you through us. Thank you, Lord, for making us the way that you did. Thanks for giving us the skills and the talents, the dyslexia and the um, the. the the slower speech. Thank you, Lord, for the uh, for the awkward bodies, and thank you, Lord, for um, what our culture would say is is not pretty. Thank you, Lord, for those things. And I pray, Lord, that you shine through it. Praise in Jesus' name.